going to just go ahead and start and hopefully we'll have some more people uh, trickle in while I do uh, housekeeping. Uh, anyway, so um, thank you everybody. This is uh, Hydrogen Developments Around the World. Um, my name is Colleen Newman. I'm with a firm called BCS. We support the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and this is uh, part of the knowledge building series, which used to be the lunch and learn series at WEC. So we've done some reorganization, but it's basically take topics like this and get our members smarter. So um, just a few words about WEC. WEC is a forward looking nonpartisan policy neutral organization focused on women, energy and environment. Um, and if you're not a member yet, um, we'd love to have you and you can check our website um, and we can you know, um, get you signed up. Um, just wanna talk about our events coming up. They're still more or less, uh, oh shoot. Uh, I'm sorry, um, they're, they're all more or less virtual still. Um, we do have an event coming up uh, called the Twilight Tour, our Arcadia Farm. So it'll be a good outdoor experience for folks who wanna socialize. We also have our virtual book club meeting and our board of directors meeting, which all members are um, uh, allowed to come to if they're interested in that. And um, we'll have more events coming up in the future. So please continue to check our website. Um, also, just wanted to mention, I'm not sure we have anybody from the press, but um, we do have a press policy. Uh, we see events are primarily for the professional development of, of, of our own members to foster an environment of candid discussion unless otherwise specified. We see events are considered to be on background. We see event attendees must obtain the speaker's permission before quoting them on any media platform. The on background status of WC events extends to reporting or broadcasting via social media. Um, we encourage you to share your experience about attending a WC event on social media, but ask that you don't quote any speakers directly without their express permission. I should say this, is, this um, will be recorded today. So I just wanna let everybody know that as well. And um, members of the press who wish to quote speakers for a publication should make arrangements directly with the speaker after the event. Lastly, I just really wanted to thank the k &L Gates team for spending time uh, from three different continents today to speak with us. Um, and also I just wanna give them a little bit of a plug for their Hydrogen Rising podcast, which they'll probably talk about, but, you know, it's really great. You know, they are about 20 minutes and they have all sorts of deep dives on various uh, topics in hydrogen. So um, I just wanted to plug and say, you know, I enjoy those and I'm going to hand it off to Sandy Safro and she's going to be moderating this morning. Great, thank you so much, Colleen, and welcome everybody. I know it's early, I'm still sipping on my coffee and I'm sure everyone else is too. Um, we appreciate everybody starting a little bit earlier with this. We've got uh, one of the partners from Canal Gate Sydney office on the phone and we've got uh, one of the partners from the Berlin office and Tracy Krauss here in Washington, DC. So we're really spanning a number of time zones, um, which was part of the reason for the earlier start today. We are really excited to be here today to talk to you all about hydrogen. It's a topic that all four of us uh, have been following closely for at least the last two years. Uh, some of us maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, as Colleen mentioned, my name is Sandy Safro. I am an Associate General Counsel for Energy and Technology Regulation with the Edison Electric Institute and I'm going to be serving as your moderator today. I also am a co-host on the Hydrogen Rising podcast. So if my voice sounds familiar to you and you listen to that podcast, that's why. Um, I'm going to start off today by uh, just introducing the panelists and then giving some very brief background on hydrogen in case um, there's anyone who is dialed in today for whom this is a totally new topic. We want to make sure that we give you some background so that the conversation today um, makes a little bit more sense. And then we're going to do the panel session through some moderated Q&A, and we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for um, questions from, from the audience. And please use the chat function in Zoom to uh, put your questions in there. And if you're not sure how to do that, um, just, you know, I think reach out to Colleen or reach out to Robin and someone can, can give you some instructions. 
Um, so thank you to, to Weezy and thank you to Kano Gates for putting this together. I'm um, just going to briefly introduce our panelists. We are joined uh, this morning by Annette Muchler Siebert, who is a partner in the Berlin office of Kano Gates. Annette focuses her practice on public procurement law and European competition and commercial law. She also advises clients on antitrust law issues and was a co-author of the Germany chapter of KNL Gates Hydrogen Handbook. We are also joined by Kelly Davies, who is a partner in the Sydney office of KNL Gates. She focuses her practice on development, acquisition, and financing of energy projects, as well as energy procurement and sustainability strategies for large businesses. Her experience spans the energy industry and includes oil and gas, power, energy storage, new fuels and related infrastructure, and Kelly was a co-author of the updated Australia chapter of the KNL Gates Hydrogen Handbook. And then we are also joined today by Tracy Krauss, who is Director of Government Relations for Cummins Inc. Uh, she represents Cummins as a co-founder of Hydrogen Forward, as a co-chair of the Hydrogen Council Policy and Advocacy Project Team, and chair of the Truck and Engine Manufacturers Association Public Policy Committee. Tracy also, Tracy also leads advocacy for Cummins Engine, New Power, Power Systems and Components business units, and product compliance and regulatory affairs and research and technology functions. So welcome ladies, I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation today. And just really briefly background on hydrogen, um, so some of you may be thinking, you know, I've heard of hydrogen before. I'm pretty sure I've heard of it in the early 2000s in the Bush administration. Why are we talking about hydrogen now and, and what's different? And there are a couple of things that are different um, at the moment. Uh, first, countries around the world are looking to reduce their carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. This is being fueled in part by commitments made in the Paris Agreement as well as uh, the significant extreme weather events that we've uh, more recently been facing around the world and the upcoming um, UN Climate Change Conference or COP26, which is slated to be held in Glasgow later, later this fall. Um, as you may know, the UK is the host country and president of COP26, and they have put out uh, four goals, and among their goals for COP26, are to secure global net zero by mid-century and to keep uh, 1.5 degrees within reach and also to finalize the Paris rule book, which uh, is the rules that are needed to implement the Paris Agreement. And they've also asked countries uh, to bring forward ambitious um, emissions reductions targets for 2030. So countries around the world are really heavily focused on this now from that perspective. And I think it won't surprise anyone to hear that there's also been a significant push in the last several years from investors and boards for uh, companies to focus on ESG principles and on reducing um, climate change and related emissions. Hydrogen is being seen as a part of the solution and an energy resource that could help reduce emissions in some of the hardest to abate sectors, which we'll touch on in a second. Um, just to talk a little bit about what hydrogen is and how it's produced, it is the most abundant element in the universe. Um, it unfortunately rarely occurs on Earth in its pure form though. Instead, it tends to bind to other molecules. So just for example, it binds to oxygen to form water, it binds to carbon to form methane or natural gas. And so in order to produce hydrogen, you have to split it from the molecule that it's bound to. And that process is called the production pathway usually. There is a color scheme that has evolved that is a shorthand to describe the production pathways and the inputs into the processes. And I'll mention this because we may talk in colors today, but the color scheme has received a lot of criticism, I think, among folks in the industry and kind of more broadly because it can be a little bit too simplistic. But um, the first main color is brown, which is used usually to talk about hydrogen produced from coal with steam reformation. Um, that will, of course, produce carbon. So there's coal, there's carbon in coal. Uh, gray hydrogen is produced from natural gas, typically through, through steam methane reformation um, without carbon capture and sequestration technology. So that would also uh, result in carbon emissions. 
Um, blue hydrogen, which is one of the more evolving technologies, is similarly uh, produced from natural gas. There's typically through steam methane reformation, but uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology would be involved. So there would be significant reduction in the carbon emissions associated with that. And the final main color of hydrogen is green, which is produced using renewable energy. So wind, solar, hydropower, and using that electricity uh, to power electrolysis, which is a, um, a process that splits water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. And so it's a very low emissions uh, production pathway for producing hydrogen and one that is um, favored by a lot of countries in their uh, policies and a lot of companies are looking at, at green hydrogen projects. But the number of different ways to produce hydrogen can give you a little bit of an insight into the um, various aspects of our existing energy economy that could play a role in hydrogen going forward. Um, and then finally, I just want to touch very briefly on how hydrogen can be used. There are so many potential applications um, one of the main uses for hydrogen is in fuel cells, um, so to as a as a feedstock essentially for fuel cells, and fuel cells can be deployed in a number of different transportation applications from um, over the road vehicles to rail to aviation to forklifts, which a lot of companies that have major logistics operations are using forklifts um, to vessels. In addition, and then there are tons of other ways um, where you can deploy fuel cells. Um, hydrogen can also be blended with natural gas in turbines um, for power generation, which I know a number of electric companies are looking at, can be used in home heating. And we were chatting as we were doing our prep session on this um, about possibly cooking Sunday dinner with, uh, with hydrogen in our homes in the near future. Um, and it can also be used as a replacement for coke in the steel manufacturing process, which uh, could also be a major emissions reduction. So the list really goes on from there. Um, I want to make sure that we get to the panel. So I'm going to go ahead and, and move to that. Um, just as a reminder, if you have questions as we go through, please just go ahead and put them in the chat and then I'll make sure to get to as many of them as we can um, towards the end. So just to start off, I think it would be really, really helpful um, for each of our panelists to uh, give us some of their general perspectives on hydrogen and talk a little bit about geographically or where you are in the market, kind of how you're approaching hydrogen. And Annette, let's, let's start with you. Thanks a lot, Sandy. I'm happy to start. Yes, I, um, as Sandy already mentioned, have a somewhat unusual perspective on hydrogen. I'm not an energy lawyer. I'm an antitrust and government contracts lawyer in Germany. Um, so knowing that Germany is rather active, that explains my interest in hydrogen. But I've also come across um, loads of work in this space, interestingly enough. So in the government contract space, public contracting authorities in Germany have started procuring hydrogen solutions, mostly for buses or trains, um, thinking about other solutions as well, but that's already happening. Um, and uh, we are advising bidders and authorities in that. Then uh, we've been approached by loads of uh, international clients that are gearing up for hydrogen solutions in the industry by either buying startup com companies or developing something themselves. So they need partnership agreements, R&D agreements. And then we got ask, uh, asked a lot about funding possibilities and all the different ways you could uh, enter into these projects that for the time being are not commercially viable. And so in Europe, there's, there's loads of different opportunities to do that. It's a bit difficult to navigate, but um, there definitely are many uh, ways of entering such projects. And I have to say, I find it particularly rewarding to work in this space because I, I genuinely believe in the advantages of hydrogen to the point of driving a hydrogen car <laughs> and uh, really love that. Um, just two additional thoughts. I think the last two years have really been a game changer, at least in Europe and in Germany, as regards hydrogen policies and funding. There's been a new wave of support. I mean, hydrogen has been a topic for quite a while, but there's been a new wave of support um, and with a broader scope. Until now, it was mostly about transportation, and now it's much broader. It's about decarbonizing industry sectors, um, so that really has changed. Um, 
And I believe that now in the transition from technology readiness to market entry, we're in the most exciting and, and interesting phase uh, and the proactive policy framework will be key to the success. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Annette. Um, Kelly, let's, let's go over to you. Same question. <laughs> Thanks. Sandy, and I think um, from my neck of the woods, I, I'm based in Australia, and obviously Australia is very active on the hydrogen front at the moment, um, and, and in collaboration with a number of other jurisdictions, in particular Germany. So Annette and I actually work very closely together on a lot of the um, the transformation projects, and the and in particular the policy developments that are that are operating in some of the leading countries. Um, over my side of the water, um, it's a really, really diverse discussion. Um, obviously, across APAC, there's such a breadth of countries and jurisdictions that are all at very different stages of their own energy security uh, and renewables development in particular that hydrogen and especially green hydrogen capability is really varied. So you've got countries like Australia that have got um, have had a massive uptake of renewables over the last five or six years and are really well placed to actually move uh, straight to a green hydrogen economy, even though the other colours that you mentioned, Sandy, have been very prevalent in, in our jurisdiction for, for a number of years. And then you've got other countries across APAC that are still going through um, their own procurement and, and commercialisation strategy to bring what we would now call conventional renewables like solar and wind into their markets, that a lot of them are having to go through market and regulatory reform um, to build that into their um, electrification and power capabilities as well as hydrogen itself and in some respects they're perhaps better placed than um, established countries like Australia, like the US, like um, countries in the EU because they're reforming once whereas a lot of us have reformed once to bring in renewables and then we're having to reform again um, to bring in hydrogen, which, as you identified, Sandy, um, can be both used in a power context, but also as a gas and potentially as a solid in, in, in substances like ammonia. There's not necessarily one regulatory framework that fits all of those different substance forms. So, you know, I think in some respects, some of those economies that are evolving for renewables generally are almost better placed because they can sort of start with a blank sheet of paper and get it right first time and hopefully learn some of those lessons from particularly the work that the EU are doing and, and Australia and the US in terms of how they might structure their own framework. Very interesting. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Tracy, we'll turn to you. Thank you so much, and thank you again for having me today. Uh, this is already really interesting. So where I work at Cummins, Cummins is uh, a US-based uh, multinational manufacturer. We're headquartered in Columbus, Indiana, here in the US. Uh, but we employ 60,000 people all over the world. And many people know Cummins uh, for big industrial diesel applications. So traditionally, we, we make diesel engines. We make natural gas engines. Um, the power about 40% of the trucks you might see on the road, but we've got a component in almost every truck you'll see on the road, whether that's a fuel system, filtration, um, emissions controls, things like that. We also manufacture power generators, uh, so those do backup for things like data centers or hospitals, and we do actually do the backup power for the Statue of Liberty or um, Wrigley Field. We also manufacture engines for industrial equipment like construction or agricultural equipment. Um, and Increasingly, as we've set really bold decarbonization targets for the company, including a goal to be uh, net zero carbon emissions in all of our products, facilities, and operations by 2050, with progressive goals to meet that along the way, it has become abundantly clear that hydrogen will be a key enabler for the decarbonization of those sectors where we're already in. And also increasing our uh, value that we can add throughout that operation because we are so familiar with these applications that need to decarbonize. And we've been in this business for over a hundred years. 
So, uh, for example, Cummins has uh, made some acquisitions in recent years that include hydrogenics, which has given us significant electrolyzer capability and therefore the ability to really be in the green or renewable hydrogen space. Um, we've been in fuel cells for over 30 years uh, in both sol solid oxide, PEM, and alkaline chemistries, so also which are you know each fit for different applications. Solid oxides fantastic for stationary power generation. We see PEM as being really viable for heavy duty truck and some of those mobile, mobile markets where we're in. And we are also in batteries. And so we do see hydrogen and batteries as being very complementary for these transportation segments where we operate. Um, certainly hydrogen fuel cell powered trucks do need batteries in them as well. And so having that capability throughout the value chain from hydrogen production through um, hydrogen in use in application is really crucial to our ability to deliver for our traditional customers and also new customers. And because I'm focused on Washington DC and in the federal and global policy space, the things that I'm thinking a lot about are what are ways that uh, different government policies can help companies like Cummins achieve scale so that costs can come down and deployment can happen at a much more sustainable and uh, greater rate so that we really are making some of these, we're realizing those gains in um, both efficiency and carbon reduction for these markets. And some of those policies include things like um, just truly internalizing the social cost of carbon in those traditional sectors where we've operated. So a price on carbon, um, whether that's a carbon contract for difference or, you know, there's certainly several mechanisms even being debated in U.S. Congress right now uh, for ways, if not to directly tax carbon, to put a price on it or to create markets around reduction. And so things like that are crucial, uh, one, to just close that delta between the cost of traditional technologies and hydrogen technologies. And then, of course, incentives for things like um, infrastructure, uh, not only for fueling, but also for hydrogen production. Uh, continued research and, research and development, because there are uh, still gaps in how um, fuel cells or hydrogen fueling and the efficiencies and the speed and um, reliability that we want to achieve especially for a company like Cummins, where we do pride ourselves on having this really robust product, durable product that our customers have come to expect. And finally, deployment. So um, not only are we you know, committed to making these products, but also to getting them out there and having them operate and realizing those, those gains that I've talked about. So um, really, you know, Cummins is operating throughout the value chain around the globe. We manufacture um, in 190 countries or territories. And um, so I'm based in the U.S., but I do see the role for hydrogen, you know, all over the globe, really depending on what, you know, uh, Kelly, you talked a little bit about um, having countries with vast renewable resources or, you know, the possibility to do domestic production, but then export. And it really depends, again, on those resources in any given country and how we can maximize those throughout the global economy. Um, and so I'm really, I, you know, it, it sounds like a lot. But, but really trying to think through the best ways uh, that Cummins can, can participate throughout that value chain and then policies can help actually lead to adoption. Great, thanks, Tracy. And actually your, your last point on um, how hydrogen is developing in different areas is a great segue into my next question, which is um, for each of the panelists just to give us their perspectives from their geographic region or sector of the um, hydrogen economy on how hydrogen is developing. Are you seeing kind of regional markets through, let's say, like the Asia Pacific region or throughout Europe? Are you seeing more national markets develop or even more local markets? I know the concept of a hydrogen hub um, in the United States was included in some legislation that um, Senator Joe Manchin put forth that is now part of the energy package. Uh, so Kelly, if we can start with you on that. Of course, Sandy, and great question. And um, firstly, I guess I'll, I'll touch on Australia because I think it leads into some of the bilateral discussions that Australia is having in particular with APAC and EU related countries. Um, Australia is definitely, um, from a media perspective and a, uh, from a federal perspective, very focused on um, international export and really being a global exporter of hydrogen um, as far across the globe as possible. 
I think um, that's all well and good, but I think we do have to recognise that Australia geographically um, isn't necessarily the best position country to be um, a, an exporter to all global regions and is probably most likely to end up being a net exporter to many of the APAC countries, in particular the likes of Japan and South Korea, who are likely to be net importers of hydrogen because they don't necessarily have um, the space per se to, to, to develop their own hydrogen production facilities at the same scale as Australia. So what that's resulted in really is a lot of bilateral discussions between Australia and Japanese at both the governmental but also the commercial level between um, key businesses. So those sort of renewables developers that are uh, prevalent and Japanese investors and conglomerates that are invested already in the Australian market are working very collaboratively to, um, to see what they can do in the way of commercialising a production and export um, capability. We're probably a few years away from seeing actual vo export at volume, but certainly um, the commercial dialogue is underway and projects are starting to be um, progressed on that basis. South Korea, much the same. At a more policy and in particular uh, certification, uh, certificates of origin type um, end of the spectrum in terms of some of those colours you spoke to, Sandy, the Australians are doing a lot of work with the EU and, and in particular Germany um, around what our certif certification schemes might look like. And that's with a couple of hats on. One is nationally, um, there's a very big mining industry and very sort of old resources industry in Australia. And that can often lead to a little a bit of political tension in terms of um, really um, promoting green schemes. Um, however, um, the federal government are certainly all in, I think, on Australia being a green hydrogen economy and are looking to the EU and Germany in particular around how they're looking at certification so that we achieve uh, something that is internationally acceptable, obviously, for sort of both inbound and outbound investment from Australia. And then I think <clears throat> the other interesting thing, and, and not to the same scale anywhere near the US, but obviously um, within Australia, we have federal level policy setting, but each state also from an energy perspective has its own ability to set its own energy policy. So in the absence of real pace and um, impact, you might say at the federal level, there's, there's a lot of talk and not a huge amount of action. The states are really taking their own energy policy into their own hands. So what you're seeing at a national level is a little bit of competition between states really to promote investment into their own state. Um, and the likes of Western Australia, um, which has great renewable resource and is very proximate to the southern parts of Asia, and so is good for an export opportunity. The same as Queensland, um, very close to the, to the Asia region, are looking at being the better um, regions for production and export, whereas the focus on policy in the other states is more about domestic supply, how we use hydrogen in existing pipelines and gas networks to homes um, and the transportation industry in terms of moving it around and whether um, trucking um, or training or other modes are the best way to move production of hydrogen around the, around the region nationally. Great, thanks Kelly. Um, before I move on to Annette, I just wanted to ask Kelly, can you talk a little bit more about the certificates of origin and um, just uh, let the audience understand a little bit more about kind of what the issue is that the certificates of origin are trying to resolve that kind of may come up in the market? Of, of course. Uh, in short, it's really a certification process that labels um, the, the method by which you produce the hydrogen in one way, shape or form, so that end users of that hydrogen, consumers of that hydrogen know what its credentials are. So does it have purely green credentials or does it sit somewhere else along the color spectrum? So that end users are able to both understand what they're buying um, in terms of its um, chemical production process, 
but also understand the carbon footprint of what they've bought, um, largely because most customers, to some of the comments Tracy has made, are really focused on decarbonizing their own business. So it gives them a certification, if you like, of how decarbonized that product is in terms of um, accreditation for their own business, the way they're accounting for their own decarbonization standards and metrics. Um, now, different certification schemes are evolving, and, and I know Annette will be able to talk to the EU one, so I won't do that. Um, and some of them are recognizing the different color schemes because they consider that some of the colors other than green need to be accredited so that we can focus on using those in the short term as transition to a fully green hydrogen economy. Um, there are other people on the other side of the fence that think we should just do away with all of that and we should all just move straight to green. Um, and it, it, there's quite a political divide in Australia, but certainly the focus at a national level, um, state by state, does seem to be more focused on moving straight to green, which is probably um, slightly contrasting to some of the other approaches across other regions. Okay, thanks, Kelly. That's, that's really helpful. Um, Annette, I'll turn over to you for the question on kind of how you're seeing hydrogen evolve, and then also if you want to talk about the certificates of origin and, and what they, the European countries and the EU um, are doing. Sure, I'm happy to. And that's, that's actually one of my favorite topics at the moment, because I think it's just so incredibly important to, to have these certificates and, and to have them in a standardized way to, to enable international trade at all. Because if you have a different basis for what you call green hydrogen or blue hydrogen in every country, you won't be able to have global trade between countries and across borders. So getting to a solution there and, and agreeing on, on what the main uh, issues are will be an important step. And it'll probably be across the whole life cycle of uh, hydrogen production, right? Including production, its transportation, its use, and you'll have to look at the carbon um, emissions during that whole life cycle and, and find a metrics that can be applied internationally. At least that's, that's my firm belief. Uh, and then we'll have a possibility to do these trading, um, create these trading routes and we'll need them. Um, that, and that's going back to Europe and, and Germany. Um, Germany is pretty active in, in hydrogen already. And they also have the declared goal to become an exporter which is kind of ambitious because uh, we don't have that much sun. We don't have that much sea. Um, we do have wind, but um, it's, uh, it's gonna be a long way. We're building elect electrolyzers at large scale at the moment, um, but there will have to be import for quite a while. There are already um, loads of strategic partnerships with countries in Africa, for example, um, about the import of bright green hydrogen. The German uh, hydrogen stra uh, strategy is very focused on green hydrogen, as is the European one. Um, it's actually the only one accepted, um, considering the Green Deal at the European level, because the EU has committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, they've also released a Fit for 55 package just this summer. And what does that mean? Um, by 2030, 55% of the carbon emissions from 1990 levels should be gone. So that's quite an ambitious goal. Uh, it includes, the package includes things like no more um, combustion engines by 2035. Um, it also includes hydrogen fuel stations every 150 kilometers, which we are far away from, I can tell you that. Um, but so this is uh, a very ambitious agenda and uh, the EU is working towards that. Um, but there will be quite a few interim steps um, to, to land there. Um, in Germany, perhaps the, the one interesting thing to mention on top of what I already said is um, we talked about the last two years being a game changer in Germany. Hydrogen has been a topic since 2006, basically. Um, there's been a large first phase of the hydrogen strategy being about R&D, only about R&D, about developing solutions. 1.5 billion, I think, euros have 
gone into that and now we're in the second stage and the second stage is about kickstarting the market so now we're talking about operative projects we're trying to develop electrolyzers that are large enough to produce hydrogen at scale um, we're talking about pilot projects for different hydrogen uses be it transportation be it energy production be it storage um, and for that again quite impressive funding nine billion have been secured for that only for germany seven for internal projects and two for external or international ones. So it's always an international collaboration we're talking about. And uh, perhaps one last interesting um, uh, particularity in Germany, the infrastructure that is a, a problem in many other countries is already evolving in the right direction. So we already have um, blending, first stage blending, um, which allows us to transport hydrogen. And then uh, Germany is planning to convert 5,900 kilometers of the natural gas pipelines to hydrogen. So that's about 15% of the overall national network that's going to be converted and can be used for transportation. That, that will be a massive step towards not only having local production, local use, but local production and being able to transport hydrogen to other areas in Germany and across Europe. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, the, the initial view on Europe. We can definitely talk about certificates of origin for hours, but I want to leave Tracy some time to talk as well. Thanks, and uh, so Tracy, I'll, I'll turn it to you for the same question on how you're maybe from more of a global perspective where Cummins that's um, seeing hydrogen, sorry, how you're seeing hydrogen develop. Hey, Mandy, and I do think similarly to Kelly in Australia, in the US, it's a very regional approach to how hydrogen can best be utilized. So California, for example, um, more similar to Germany, has very strong um, green or renewable hydrogen targets and incentives for production, well, for infrastructure and, and um, really pushing for production in that space. Again, I think all markets in the US are just inherently a little bit behind um, where things are in Europe, but California is certainly um, the furthest along in terms of developing that market and they have hydrogen highways and um, other policies to really incentivize uh, the build out of um, renewable hydrogen specifically. But then there's places in Texas, I'm thinking of Houston, for example, that have really large um, oil and gas assets that those companies as well are looking to decarbonize. Um, and they're also, they use hydrogen as a feedstock for a lot of their refining processes or um, in other chemical or industrial processes. And in those places where you're already uh, using steam methane reformation to add carbon capture and to use um, more blue hydrogen, it's absolutely something that can help us get to scale, help bring the cost down uh, to make sure that uh, hydrogen is best being utilized um, throughout the US. So I do think, you know, there's certainly regional aspects to what are the assets in that region and how can you best utilize them. Um, again, I, for Cummins, I think we see the need for all of the different flavors or colors of hydrogen, um, all of the different production methods as we scale up so that we can continue to bring costs down. Um, and then as those costs come down, it, it does become easier to transition some of those assets to renewable or, or green produced with electrolysis. And then in terms of globally, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about our production or manufacturing strategy with regards to hydrogen and maybe electrolyzers. Um, so right now Cummins manufactures electrolyzers. Uh, we're a U.S. headquartered company and a lot of our R&D is based here in the U.S. Uh, but we manufacture electrolyzers um, in Europe and in Canada right now. And part of that is just um, where, where, you know, different um, policies help it make sense where the markets are at Cummins generally, we manufacture for the market. So we make uh, North America engines here in North America, um, you know, Chinese engines in China and so forth. Um, so I think as policies come up in any given region, you know, it certainly makes sense for us to uh, have domestic capability there. So I would say, you know, if, if we have any policymakers listening, you know, the more policies there are to incentivize uh, that 
the product that we're manufacturing, the more likely it is to for us to invest in that domestic capability. Um, and we do prefer that without any sort of domestic content requirement because, in, you know, generally just the, the um, incentives and, and the market creation are enough for us. So it's not about restrictions. It's about how, how can we actually get folks to purchase that product, something like an electrolyzer. I'll also say we, we have some interesting projects in the UK, uh, for example, on hydrogen internal combustion engines. And one of the reasons we think that's an interesting um, and, and valuable concept right now is because as that market scales up, as production, hydrogen production ramps up, we think that they play to reduce emissions today, um, whether that's criteria pollutants for air quality or uh, carbon emissions. And to, to have something like a hydrogen internal combustion engine that can take advantage of some of that um, infrastructure build out while also being more of a low cost solution in the interim or what we at Cummins call the messy middle of that you know, period of decarbonization between now and 2050. And I keep showing this in my head, it's a, it's a lovely graph that, that shows um, uh, renewables ramping up, but um, we do think that some of these technologies that can take advantage of some of the scaling in the interim could be really great uh, to make immediate air quality benefits while we continue that scale up and continue to reduce costs on the fuel cell side. So we really are trying to think throughout that value chain. And again, different regulations in different places, different um, domestic capabilities or resources will make a difference on where those assets are utilized and, and how that global trade might work for those products. That's great. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Tracy mentioned uh, current use of, of hydrogen um, in the uh, petroleum refining sector, and um, I think it's a good segue uh, into kind of the next question, which um, we'll touch a little bit on Catherine's question in the chat. Thank you, Catherine, for, for putting that in there. Um, so uh, we do, as I mentioned, currently use hydrogen in the um, petroleum refining process. It's used um, in the petrochemical space. It's used for agricultural fertilizer. And the U.S. produces about 10 million metric tons of hydrogen per year. And globally, there's about 70 million metric tons, give or take, of hydrogen produced a year. The majority of that is either brown or gray hydrogen currently. So the look, of course, is to move more towards lower carbon footprint uh, production pathways. And also, I think a data point that is helpful to bear in mind is that the majority of hydrogen that's produced currently is produced on site or it's considered captive hydrogen. So there isn't necessarily this robust value chain built out from a transportation perspective to move hydrogen, even though we are currently using it from where it's produced to where it's consumed. Of course, if we're talking about scaling up, we're going to need to think about what that value chain looks like. So very long lead into the question, which is um, really from like a value chain perspective or a policy perspective or economic perspective, what are some of the challenges that you see for hydrogen in terms of the ability for the market to scale up? Um, and if you have thoughts or if you're seeing anything on what those solutions might look like um, to kind of solve for those challenges, that would be really interesting to hear too. And Tracy, we'll turn it back to you to start off on this question. Thanks, Sandy. And I'll say, I mean, from Cummins' perspective, one of the biggest challenges right now is, of course, cost. And that's cost of any, any end product, but also production costs, manufacturing costs. Um, so really, for us to achieve any sort of scale, there needs to be something to address that cost differential, because our customers are just not going to uptake a solution, especially in the heavy-duty truck markets, where um, these customers you know, this is a work vehicle. It's not a personal vehicle where they they may be like a color or a feature, right? It's it's much more about can this vehicle do the job I need at the lowest cost because it's a capital cost for me, and so that investment just does not make sense uh, when you have the current deltas between an internal combustion product and a hydrogen fuel cell product. And so something like a uh, carbon price, which I mentioned earlier, would be crucial in addressing sort of the economy-wide impacts throughout the value chain. It's a really clean and elegant solution to address the host of problems that might occur throughout that value chain, um, not only to bring the production costs down on the fuel or to at least um, 
even them out a little bit with traditional fuels, uh, but then also for the fuel cell or the utilization equipment for that hydrogen and the tanks and all of the other things you need um, to actually be able to use it. Um, I would also say that um, if you can't have a car, you know, politically carbon prices can be difficult. I did see a question in the chat about a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which I would say can be effective to prevent carbon leakage, when, but it needs to be paired with the carbon price, which I know in Europe and Canada, those policymakers are in the US, there has been discussion of uh, having a carbon border adjustment mechanism without a, a domestic carbon price, which might be a little bit putting the cart before the horse. Um, although they're saying there might be other car domestic carbon policies in play, whether that's a clean energy payment program or um, clean energy standard for, for the electricity grid. Um, I would say a carbon border adjustment mechanism to address some of those um, cost disparities and scale up issues that I mentioned would need to be paired with that price. Um, absent a price, some of those other incentives, things like, um, I see their question on, on federal incentives. So for example, the clean hydrogen production credit that was introduced by uh, Senator Carper in the Senate and Congressman Larson in the US House, uh, which provides $3 per kilogram for uh, renewable hydrogen production. The cost of the incentive ramps down as the carbon intensity of the hydrogen ramps up, so it is technology neutral. But something like that would is really crucial, again, to reduce the costs of the hydrogen production in order to make that a sound investment. So I think as the costs come down as that primary um, obstacle, other obstacles, right? So there's, there's certain metals used in fuel cells that have some of the same challenges that we see in batteries, or um, certainly the fueling speeds are something that in, in trucking are really important. So some of those other recent Surge problems that we need to address become more cost effective to address when the market is there. So um, I think, you know, coming from the business side, it, it is certainly a business equation that we see. That's great. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, and that will turn to you. And I think we've got about 10 minutes left. So again, if anyone has questions, I know a couple have come in in the chat. Please feel free to put them in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry, Annette, oh, over to you on the challenges <laughs> and potential solutions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know I was up. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I uh, am really grateful to Tracy for uh, mentioning the carbon border adjustment mechanism, because that was something I was going to talk about anyways. Um, so in the EU, we've got that EU emissions trading system within the EU which um, is a cap and trading system, meaning so companies can buy a certain amount of emissions um, certificates, and then that's limited at a certain point. And if they want to use more than that, they have to buy additional emissions uh, certificates. And that has so far only worked within the EU and only within certain sectors. So it's only been in, in energy production and in emission heavy manufacturing now, that fit for 55 package um, wants to extend that to shipping as well and aviation in a broader way, um, and also to, to building and road transportation. And then the most important development, I think, is exactly that carbon um, border adjustment mechanism that extends it to products being imported to the EU. And the whole goal is to create a level playing field because it, within the EU, you would have to pay that additional price on particularly carbon intense products. And when they're imported from outside the EU, you would not. So that's what um, they're trying to remedy by that new introduction of the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And we've talked a lot about this um, also with Kelly and all the other colleagues. And the, the general feeling is that that will make a big difference to manufacturers in the US or Australia. So that mechanism will definitely help creating a level playing field throughout uh, the regions and more globally. Um, as to the challenges and uh, other solutions, one um, specific uh, solution we're trying in Germany at the moment is um, the H2 Global project. That's a dual-sided auction process. So basically, um, 
the auction selects the best price for long-term import of green hydrogen, because we will be an importer for a certain while, and then the best price offered for the purchase and the delta delta between the two is gonna be paid by the state. So it's a kind of subsidy on the basis of a dual auction process. That's also meant to incentivize purchase of green hydrogen instead of blue or gray hydrogen. That's just one of the solutions we're talking about. But Kelly certainly has to add from the Australian perspective as well. I guess that's my cue. Um, carbon pricing in particular. So I think, you know, to echo Tracy's comments and just the broader supply chain issues, it's, it's the chicken and the egg, right? I think in nearly every jurisdiction and every region, which is to drive cost of production down, we need scale of use at the end of the value chain. Uh, and um, to drive end of the value chain cost of production down, we need scale of production. So I think that's the challenge we're all grappling with at the moment. But um, to some of Tracy and uh, Annette's comments and some of the questions coming through the chat, I, I think, and I'm not always a big fan of them, but it's about policy support um, and um, underwriting from governments, whether they be state or federal level, uh, in the short term. However, I spoke a word of caution in my experience, um, and we've seen it in renewables in Australia, that um, large, quick um, underwriting schemes can sometimes lead to unanticipated market issues where there's a real race to the bottom, and you can see businesses fail quickly um, and not in a very pleasant way. So I suppose my word of caution would be that if we're going to adopt policy frameworks that either whether they support carbon pricing, goodness, let's call it carbon tax, let's not talk about that in Australia, I'll come to that in a second, um, or whether it's just offtake opportunities um, that allow for um, certainty in revenue stream for production facilities that allow them to bring in financing, uh, external financing, and therefore drive down the cost of capital rather than using equity in their balance sheets. I would want to see that done in a sustainable and manageable way, because I think if we do too much too fast, um, we give a false sense of economy in the industry and businesses will collapse because of it. We've seen it in Australia with um, the race to bottom of solar and solar pricing. Um, I think to some of the comments around carbon pricing, Australia, that's a really, that's a political hot potato in Australia, and it has been for many, many years, given the balance of industries here. And look, at a federal level, there's um, there's not a lot of appetite to set that type of policy um, here, that there's a political view that um, it will just, um, it would be um, very detrimental to a number of businesses. I think having said that, and, and this probably goes to some of the questions in the chat around sort of Triggy Forest's, um, you know, announcements around um, several gigawatts of hydrogen being exported by 2030 and things like that. If you'd have asked me a couple of years ago when we first started talking about hydrogen seriously in the Australian market, um, whether there would be gen genuine big business support for moving and supporting that energy tradition, I'd have said no, because a lot of the resources industry in over here were just not interested. But I think over the last 12 months in particular, you've seen a lot of changes. You've seen BHP, for example, over here, adopt a lot of new technologies and change their heavy um, heavy vehicle trucks. Uh, the ones that go down into the mines are really big, uh, big, enormous ones. You've seen obviously the likes of Fortescue are really championing becoming a new energy business. So moving sort of from resources into energy itself, as well as their traditional resources business. So I think for those reasons and all the other reasons where we're seeing shareholders, investors, funds, having to move out of old energy technologies that are uh, carbon intense or carbon em em emissions intense and having to move to decarbonized goals. I think in Australia, we're doing it commercially and in the private sector absent um, any policy setting around carbon prices. I think the real challenge for us is not making some of those mistakes that we've made by doing things too quickly. I think the other thing, the flip side of that coin is we need to move a bit quicker. You 
Annette spoke to billions of euros being deployed in Germany alone. And when you talk about Australia, we talk about millions of Australian dollars. And that is an insignificant amount of funding, to my mind, comparative to what Australia wants to do and how it wants it to position itself globally. So I think you've got to get that balance right. I think it's policy setting on the one hand, absent material private sector progression, but I think we have that in Australia. But I also think you need the funding. You've got to have the offtakes there. I mean, most of my clients and the work that we're doing is all about strategic positioning because there are no offtakes. Um, there's no one there to buy it, um, even if it's not a, a particularly palatable price. So there are some offtakes evolving that aren't necessarily cost competitive, but certainly some of our clients are still very keen to enter into those transactions because they want to get a foothold on the market to come. And they see that as the ability to do that. And they're prepared to put some equity at risk in doing that because it's not as cost effective. But there just isn't the volume um, uh, in terms of people that want the volume of hydrogen to give them the volume that they want to produce. So they want to produce gigatons, but people the other end only want a couple of tons here or there to kind of try things out to start with. That's great. Thank, thank you all for, for that. Um, I'm going to put up a slide or I'm going to attempt to put up a slide with um, some additional resources from KNL Gates and from Commons on hydrogen. I think we may um, have some bifurcation in the chat. So um, for our panelists, if there were any questions that you saw in the chat that you felt like you wanted to answer, please go ahead and, and feel free to unmute yourself and do that while I attempt to put this slide up. I can just mention that I a little bit touched on the US federal incentives question, but um, I, I spoke about a tax credit. I think the single most important thing the US should be doing right now is implementing our own hydrogen strategy, similarly to what Germany has done, what the UK recently did. Um, EU has a regional one, Korea, Japan. I think to really create a market for industry, it is so helpful to see what the, um, the government's goals are on throughout that value chain. So I would say any one country looking to really facilitate a market startup on hydrogen should should have their own um, domestic hydrogen strategy because that is, you know, it allows then the policies to come in place to get there. So, you know, I will say Department of Energy with their um, hydrogen shot initiative is a, a great start. And I would just love to see that uh, cross coordinated with Department of Transportation, EPA, uh, CEQ, so some of the other agencies throughout the government to make sure that we're all singing from the same song sheet. That's great, thank you, Tracy. Um, so we are actually just at 9.30 and it seems I can't share the screen. So I will just also put up the K, I just put the Cummins websites in there and I'll put up the KNL Gates website with the hydrogen materials on it as well into the chat so folks have uh, that information available as well. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. I think this was a really interesting conversation today and hopefully everybody got a little bit more of a sense of what's going on globally with hydrogen. Um, thank you again to Lisi for the opportunity to do this today. This was a lot of fun. And Colleen, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, well, thank you, Sandra. This was a very um, exciting panel. I know I learned a, a lot. And um, I think Kelly, especially since it's probably 1130 in Australia. So I hope you get a good, it's, it's like, I, I hope you get home and get a good night's sleep tonight. So really appreciate that. But um, yeah, this was a really great conversation. And again, wanted to thank Sandy and Kano Gates and Coomings for um, participating and you know, hope to continue the conversation. I think we're done. Thank you, everybody, for participating and taking time out of your day. And hope everybody has a good Tuesday, or in Kelly's case, a good Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you.